hopefully in, in the uh, near foreseeable future. Thank you. Hey, hate to ruin the illusion, but I didn't want to pass out dead in front of you. So um, why am I dressed this way? Well, it's how I usually dress on Saturdays. But um, also because it pertains to the tale I'm about to tell, no pun intended, about animals in the Civil War and what a vital role they played in ways that it's really hard to imagine uh, for us today. So uh, to begin with, uh, I'm going to talk about how sort of different categories in which they made a major difference, uh, such as as a source of food, uh, as a source of war materials, and, and other day-to-day -day materials that people in the middle of the 19th century really depended on, uh, as a means of moving supplies, uh, as an offensive force. I'm going to focus in on the cavalry. And I'm going to talk about the use in ways that we don't ordinarily think of, or many of us don't may ordinarily think of, and as mascots, both as what I would call functional mascots and as mascots, uh, just per se. So to begin with, I think one of the things that's often overlooked is the importance of animals in, in determining the outcome of the Civil War just as a source of food. Uh, you know, things like pork, beef, mutton, fowl were vital to the diets of soldiers. As Napoleon once said, an army marches on its stomach. So one of the key factors in determining who's going to win the Civil War is which side can best feed and supply their armies. Now, uh, there are things happening both in the North and the South uh, that will affect that. And uh, one of the misconceptions about the Civil War is people think, well, gee, when you look at the two sides, the you know, Confederacy uh, is, is sort of the agricultural power, and the North is sort of the industrial power. And that's where both of their strengths lie. Well, in fact, uh, well, let me go back here. In fact, the North is both an industrial and agricultural power. The South has some areas in which they are very strong in terms of their agriculture. For example, in terms of the Shenandoah Valley, that's called the breadbasket of the Confederacy. And out West, they have a lot of cattle uh, to supply you know, the meat protein part of the Confederacy. But the truth is, by the time of the Civil War, the North has far more agricultural capacity than the South does, both in terms of crops and in terms of livestock, for a number of reasons. One, they have more territory. Two, the South has invested a lot of its agriculture in what would be called cash crops, things like tobacco and cotton, which can give them a lot of money, but you can't eat them. Okay. And finally, the North is incorporating a lot more technology in its um, farming, including mechanization, whereas the South is still largely relying upon manual labor, much of that supplied by enslaved labor. So by the time of the Civil War, again, the North is an agricultural powerhouse, and what's more, they have the industry that can take full advantage of it. What's one of the biggest uh, challenges in the Civil War? How do you get your crops, your meat, your, all your foods to the front lines without it spoiling? Well, at the time of the Civil War, the best way of doing that was through canning. Now, the beginning of canning went back to the Napoleonic Wars, but by the time of the Civil War, the Union has developed the wherewithal to can massive amounts of food and get it to the front lines. You've got to remember, this is very important because this is in, in an age where they didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have freezing. So if you're going to get food without spoiling, canning is the way. And one of the best examples of this is this product here, condensed milk. This is produced 
by the millions throughout the Civil War by the Union, by the Borden Company. And today we think of it mainly as a cooking ingredient, but during the Civil War, Union soldiers treasured this stuff. It could be easily put in their knapsacks. It is something that they can you know, easily drink any time of the day or consume in any way during the time of the day. It is pure. It is known for its purity. Unlike their drinking supplies and many other kinds of things they may come across, this stuff is pure. It won't make them sick. It is also an enormously important supply of calories, which is what you need when you are constantly on the march or in a battle. There are about 1,300 calories in this small little can. And the other thing that's very, very important about it is there's a lot of sugar in here, which means when you consume this, you get a lot of energy. It's kind of the Red Bull of its time. So Union soldiers really value this, and Confederate soldiers do too. But the problem with Confederate soldiers is they really value all these canned foods. They can't get them, though, because the Confederacy does not have the capacity, the industry, to can these goods. So very often, the only way the Confederates can ever get their hands on this stuff is by capturing Union supplies. So this will make a big difference in the war, reason being, is when you look at the final stages of the war, why are many Confederate soldiers deserting? It's because both at home and in the army, people are near starvation or at starvation, and that's what causes, in many ways, the total, total uh, mass desertion rates that start to occur in the Confederate armies. So food and the ability to supply it is one of the decisive factors in the Union's eventual victory. So let's look at other things that animals supply. Well, they supply all sorts of materials that are necessary for the war effort. First of all, there's leather supplied by animal hides. That's used in a variety of products, everything from saddles to reins to gloves to belts, and most importantly, shoes and boots. An army cannot walk, cannot march without leather. Okay, wool. Wool is used in almost you know, every aspect of life and every aspect of the military. The uniforms on both sides are largely wool. It's a miserable material, but that's what they're made out of. Uh, the socks, made of wool. Mittens, made of wool. Blankets, made of wool. Now, again, the Union has a tremendous advantage in both of these supplies for a couple of reasons. One, they have more of the raw material, but secondly, they have the industrial wherewithal to produce more finished goods. The Union, in the course of the war, outproduces the Confederacy in terms of wool and other textiles by a rate of 17 to 1. And in terms of leather, the rate is 30 to 1. Okay, so these, again, make an enormous difference. Now you look at other things, just a basic aspect of light, uh, life. How do you see at night? This is before they have electricity. You do it through either two primary means. Either you do it through candles or you do it through lamps. Okay, in terms of candles, where do you get candles from? Well, you either get it from tallow, which is beef fat, or you get it from things like beeswax, okay, if you want a higher grade of candle. But the favored type of candle comes from something called spermaceti. Where does that come from? It's a whale oil derivative. And who has the advantage in terms of whale oil supplies? The Union, because they have a whale oil industry. The Confederacy does not. So the other thing we can look at, since we're a medical museum, is medical supplies. Things like sutures and other medical goods. Well, here again, the Union has advantage. One of the favored sutures during the Civil War is silk thread. Silk is a remarkably good suture material. In fact, we still use it today. Um, where does it come from? Well, at the time it was imported, a lot of silk thread came from France. Well, the Union could import all the silk thread it wanted. The Confederacy could not, reason being because the Union Navy had a blockade around the South. 
that got increasingly effective. So by the middle of the Civil War, the Confederacy is running out of suture materials. Now, there's an ironic twist to this, a little bit of a tale, pun intended. So the Confederacy is running out of silk and other imported threads. So they got to develop their own material, suture material, from something they do have access to. Someone comes up with the idea of using horsehair. Does anyone here think that horsehair would make a good suture material? So you're a bunch of naysayers. Little joke, sorry. So I had to saddle you with that. Okay, anyway, yeah, it gets worse. Anyway, okay, what? <laughs> so anyway, there, there are reasons to think that for a couple of reasons. Horse hair is not the most sanitary you know, material given its proximity to what the horse is doing there. So does that bother Confederate surgeons? Not really, because this is before germ theory. They don't understand the relationship between germs and the spread of infection. But what does concern Confederate surgeons is that in its natural state, horsehair is very stiff. It's a strong material, but it's also very stiff. It doesn't tie very tightly into a tight knot, which pr is problematic for a suture. So they got to figure out a way of making it softer, more pliable, more easily tied. They develop a solution, you boil it. And by boiling it, it does everything they want it to do and something they don't appreciate. It helps sterilize it. So they will start to use it. After the war, and I emphasize after the war, they'll find out that actually the rates of infection among those men who were sewn up with the silk thread suture, uh, pardon me, horsehair sutures, was actually lower than those who were stitched up with other materials. So again, another example where animals are providing a vital uh, medical uh, material. I also have maggots up here because maggots were found to, by the Confederacy to be a useful way of cleaning up wounds. And that's something that's still done today. We still have special, what I call factories, which produce maggots, which can be used in certain cases to clean wounds when other ways are not uh, practical or effective. So, um, as you can see, in terms of materials of everyday life and the military, animals are supplying essential goods. But now the question is, how do you get them to the front lines? And so, you know, when we think of the Civil War, many historians call it the first modern war because it's using new technologies. And one of the ones they focus in on are railroads. And it's true. The Civil War is one of the first major wars where they're using railroads in a major way to transport all sorts of things, men and material. But the truth is, the main burden on getting materials to the front lines during the Civil War will still fall on horses and mules, which we call equines. And um, I'm, I'm just going to give a couple of you know, examples. One is sort of a micro example, and one is a macro example. So the micro example, which you'll see in, in this museum, is when you talk about a Union artillery battery, you're talking about six cannons. Six cannons. Now, in order to transport all those cannons and all the materials and all the men for that one artillery battery, that takes 72 to 100 horses. All right, now another example, Sherman's March to the Sea. Well, that's renowned by historians for being, you know, a campaign with a bare bones supply line. They're living off the land. They're procuring stuff from the plantations and farms. So, you know, they're, they're really, you know, avoiding the traditional long, you know, supply line thing. Well, even that bare bones campaign, when you look up here, you'll see it involved over 36,000 mules. 32,000 horses. And then when you factor in all the other things, it comes to about 72,000 equines just for that bare bones operation. One other example, the three-day battle of Gettysburg involved about 73,000 horses and mules. So moving away from the supply aspect for a second, Let's talk about the offensive capability of animals. And for that, we always think of the cavalry. So the, 
image that comes to our mind that we see in movies and TV depictions of the Civil War are cavalry battles. And there are some massive cavalry battles, some that are very important and decisive. The largest one was at Brandy Station in 1863. There were over 19,000 horsemen and horses involved in that battle. It's a one-day battle. It is the largest cavalry battle ever fought in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, it is, you know, not a decisive battle, but it will lead to another one, which is the Battle of Gettysburg. And there is a, you know, a very important cavalry battle on the third day of Gettysburg, again, involving, you know, thousands of horses, some famous names, Jeb Stewart, George Custer. So cavalry played a very, very important role in terms of attacking an enemy, very often by surprise, you know, with, with, with great force. Um, but even though we're familiar with that aspect of the cavalry, in truth, they played an even more important role in another respect, and that is the Civil War was fought in an age where you didn't have spy satellites, you didn't have drones, you didn't have electronic uh, you know, surveillance measures. So the cavalry was really the eyes and ears of the army. They played an enormous intelligence ro uh, role by what was called screening, kind of going on the outside of the army to try to detect any enemy movement or probing behind enemy lines to try to observe enemy movements or the di uh, disposition of, of enemy forces, and then to report back to their commanders on what was going on. That was a key factor in a commander's ability to figure out how he should position his troops, what his tactics will be. Indeed, if anyone ever sees the movie Gettysburg, has anyone ever seen that movie? Yeah, it's a good movie. One of the key scenes in that is you'll see, you know, Jeb Stewart returns from this big raid he's done all around, and he goes to Lee, and he says, boy, I captured all these wagons, I've done all these great things, and Lee is furious at him. Reason why is, Lee tells him, that's not your primary job. Your primary job was to observe things and get back to me so I can figure out what the situation is. For the last few days, I've been going around blind because I've not received reports from you. So the intelligence function of the cavalry is a very, very vital one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the unsung heroes of the Civil War, and that is uh, mules. Uh, as the war goes on, mules will become an increasingly important part of supplying the armies. Um, they are you know, regarded by many as being kind of stubborn, kind of dumb, but in reality, they're extraordinary animals. They're the hybrid of a male donkey and a female horse. As a result, they're sterile, uh, but they have a lot of great attributes. They are uh, very uh, resilient animals. They are, for the most part, much steadier on their feet, much more sure-footed in a variety of conditions and terrains that were bother horses, where horses might go lame. Uh, they, as draft animals or pack animals, can be relied upon to uh, carry weights that are proportionately as great as horses. Um, and the mule's ability to supply the US Army, not only in the Civil War, but in earlier wars and in much later wars going to today, meant that you know, they were a mainstay of the U.S. Army. And because of that, when the Army uh, U.S. Military Academy decided to pick a mascot, they picked a mule. It's not the most glamorous animal in the world, but as they say, it's the animal that gets the job done. And so we see some images of uh, mules at, uh, in the Civil War and at West Point. Now I'm going to talk about one more glamorous aspect of mules. It's a little known story, but it's their uh, charge at the Battle of the Wahatchee. Uh, 
So in 18, October of 1863, approximately 200 Union mules are tethered together uh, on the banks of the Wahatchee River. Uh, it's nighttime, and all of a sudden, there's an artillery explosion nearby. They kind of freak out, and they break off of their tethers. And fortunately for the Union, they charge in the direction of the Confederate forces under Wade Hampton. This is in the middle of the night. So Wade Hampton's soldiers hear this you know, stampede coming at them. They don't think it's a stampede. They think it's a Union cavalry charge. So they break ranks and they retreat. So um, someone wrote a, a very funny uh, poem to this miraculous charge. There is a story, it's probably apocryphal, but it's funny nonetheless, I'll tell it, that the following day when Union Commander Ulysses S. Grant was informed of this successful charge, he said that he was going to promote the mules to horses. <laughs> So one of the things that is also touched upon here at the museum is the Civil War really marks the birth of the American veterinary uh, system and the, and, 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 and the birth of the kind of veterinary professionals that we see today. At the outset of the Civil War, hard to imagine, there were only 50 veterinarians in the entire United States. These are people with veterinary degrees. They all had to obtain them from overseas. Okay, but during 1861, the Union will form a veterinary service, which for the first time commissions officers who are veterinarians to look after um, you know, uh, the care of horses and mules. Um, and uh, it, it will, get to the point where at least every cavalry regiment will be assigned uh, a veterinary officer uh, or surgeon. Uh, the Confederates, on the other hand, never developed any kind of system for really caring for their animals in any kind of centralized way. Basically, what the Confederates do is they charge the individual soldier, or in the, in the case of the cavalry, a cavalryman, with the care and feeding of their animal. And in fact, they don't even supply the animals. It's up to the individual Confederate cavalrymen to find a replacement horse should he lose his horse during you know, battle or, or for any condition. Um, this creates a growing disparity between the two sides. The Union, as the war goes on, is better able to provide for its horses and mules. They develop good healthcare systems, places, large centers where the horses can be rehabilitated. Uh, the Confederacy does not do so. Likewise, in terms of providing for the feed and care of animals in the field, the Union steadily improves. The Confederate conditions, as was true of their men, grow more dire. They have more trouble providing adequate food for their horses. Indeed, one of uh, one of the most important letters that Lee writes to uh, the president, Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy, is he says at one point, we cannot feed our animals, and unless we can, the situation of our armies is untenable. So despite the uh, efforts on both sides to care for animals, the war takes a terrible toll on them, particularly in terms of equines. It's estimated that 1.2 million horses and mules die during the Civil War. Uh, that's roughly twice the number of, of, of equine deaths than men who die in the Civil War. So it's, it's an enormous toll. So, oh, yes, sir? There were situations where, or reports in, in certain really bad conditions where mules were supposedly eaten. It didn't happen that commonly during the Civil War, and it was, it was avoided usually. Uh, uh, there were a couple of anecdotal reports where in, in certain battles where supply lines were cut off. There are some reports, for example, at Vicksburg that 
maybe some of the men and some of the civilians may have eaten mules, but it wasn't a common practice. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about mascots, and I'm going to kind of divide them into two categories. One is practical mascots. Now, these are animals that served a practical purpose, but were also, uh, over time, more and more seen as mascots. One of the most important were goats. So uh, goats were often in the, on Navy ships. This was a traditional practice going back to uh, the British Navy and the American Navy adopted it. And on board a ship, it was very common to have an area called the manger where you would have live farm animals. And that was so the officers could get fresh meat, fresh milk, fresh eggs. Uh, goats supplied fresh milk and occasionally fresh meat. Uh, the milk could be used for milk, for cheese, for butter. Um, so you might ask, well, gee, why don't they use cows? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> cramped quarters on the ship, and uh, goats tend to be a lot smaller than, than uh, cows, but also they're much more sure-footed. Um, they tend to you know, not lose their balance, even in the worst of seas. They don't get seasick, unlike chickens, by the way. Um, <laughs> And goats uh, are easy to maintain because you can feed them, you know, s scraps and stuff like that. So they're kind of like disposals. And also, goats, shockingly, are great swimmers, unlike many of the sailors aboard our ships at the time of the Civil War. And there was kind of a, you know, joke that if you could teach them to man the guns, they might make better sailors than most <laughs> of the things. So if you've ever wondered why the Naval Academy has a goat as its mascot, that's why. They were kind of a fixture of, you know, uh, American sailing ships. Now, by the time of the Civil War, the Union Navy uh, is transitioning away from having the need to have a lot of these far, uh, you know, farm animals on board their ships. They're developing better logistical systems to provide fresh food and stuff like that. Nonetheless, goats will stay aboard many of these ships going into the 20th century and even into the 21st century because they're regarded as good mascots. So um, that is how one practical mascot gradually transitioned into being a pure mascot. Dogs and cats. Well, dogs, small dogs, and cats also were a fixture on many ships. And this is a tradition going back particularly in terms of cats, to antiquity. Why? They were used as ratters. They were the ones that would, you know, uh, dig out, uh, you know, rats, mice, and other vermin that could attack valuable supplies aboard a ship, uh, things that were essential, like the, uh, the rope lines, or the canvas for the sails, or the food supply. And so these animals played a very important role aboard U.S. Navy ships. Uh, they did, um, again, not only during the Civil War, but they remained on these ships through the 19th century and into the 20th century. Uh, and you see some examples here of animals that continued to serve. They also served uh, for until, I think, the 1970s or 1980s aboard the British, uh, uh, British Navy ships. So uh, they played a very important role. Now, one of the more famous uh, animals, cats, in the Civil War, it's a mystery, was a black cat that served aboard the Monitor. And um, the Monitor fought that famous battle at Hampton Roads between it and the ship that many people call the Merrimack, but was actually the Virginia. And they went head to head, and they fought it out. And depending on who you ask, uh, if you ask a person who's you know, pro-Confederacy, they say they fought to a draw. If you talk to someone who you know, has a more accurate uh, picture of the thing, they'll say that they monitor one. But in any event, shortly after that bell, a few months after that bell, the monitor sinks off the coast of Carolina. Now, the cat was on board the ship. And according to one of the seamen, whose last name was Butts, no joke, um, he claimed he heard the cat, you know, screaming, and the cat was on top of one of the gun barrels. So 
out of humanity, out of concern for the cat, he did what any humane person would do. He stuffed the cat into the battle, and then he shoved a bunch of stuff further into the battle to plug up the gun. This is in an ironclad that's sinking. Okay, how that makes any sense whatsoever in terms of helping the cat out, we don't know. But he claims he did that, and then he left the ship, and the cat went down with the ship. Apparently, uh, the crewmen, other crewmen aboard the ship said that anything that came out of Butts' mouth was, you know, total nonsense. It was a thing. So for decades, there was this controversy. Did the cat go down with the ship? So about 100 years later, the monitor is found, and then slowly, um, over the course of about a decade, uh, they, they raise different portions of it, they bring it into the museum there, and they slowly start to you know, sift through all the remnants of the ship. Well, about two years ago, they finally got to the point where they could bore into the barrels to see what was in there. So um, they start doing it. It's a very painstaking process. And the question is, will they find a cat skeleton? Well, I'm pleased to announce they did not. So it turns out that Butts was full of you know, malarkey. And fortunately, two possibilities, either the cat lived to fight another day, or there was never even a cat aboard the ship. There's some question about that. But anyway, uh, God bless this cat, wherever he may be. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about also practical animals that were icons. Uh, we have uh, Lee and Traveler. Lee was, you know, known to, to ride Traveler into battles. He was revered, and I'm talking about the horse, by the men. Uh, after the war, Traveler went to what was then called Washington College, where Lee was the president. And after Lee died, um, Traveler, when he passed a few years later, eventually ended up being buried not far from where the Lee family is buried. Now, Grant, I've given this talk before, and usually there's somebody in the audience who very angrily says to me, why don't you talk about the fact that Cincinnati, Grant's famous horse, was buried in Grant's tomb? And I'll tell you why I don't tell you that. Uh, first of all, a little bit about Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a great horse. He was a thoroughbred. He was the son of one of the greatest horses at the time in racing history. He was given to Grant as a, um, as a present during the war. Uh, Grant truly treasured him, um, so much so that after the war, he took him to the White House with him. And when he got to the point where you know, he could no longer ride him. He was offered a ton of money by people for the horse. One person offered him $10,000, which in 1870s money is a lot of money. But Grant said no. Instead, he gave them to a friend, Admiral uh, Daniel Arman, who uh, had a horse farm in Maryland, and he allowed um, Cincinnati to live out the rest of his life in peace. Uh, and and that's, that's where he died and was buried. Now, okay, Grant's tomb. First of all, uh, if you ever want to annoy somebody, you say, who's buried in Grant's tomb? And they'll go, ha, 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 Grant and, and his wife. And you go, no, you're wrong, because they're both in sarcophaguses, and they're above the ground, so technically no one is. And after, if, if the friendship is patched up after that, uh, you can assure them that the horse Cincinnati was not you know, buried in Grant's tomb. Uh, but the two of them kind of live on in, because in almost any statue of Grant, you'll see him riding atop um, Cincinnati. And of course, the most famous example of that is a statue in front of the US Capitol building. And that's close up and in, in thing. It's a very impressive sculpture. It's one of my favorites. Um, so, wait. So now we'll deal with just mascots. And these are animals uh, that do have practical purposes, but they're also primarily there for companionship. 
They help to cheer up the morale of men who are far from their family and friends. They're on the front lines. They help boost morale and, and unit pride. And they try, in some instances, to instill the fighting spirit in the men uh, of the regiments or, or vessels that they're part of. Uh, this, uh, you may have uh, correctly deduced, is not a Civil War picture. Those are my dogs and my cat. So anyway, <laughs> and you can see how thrilled they are to be in their Civil War uniforms. OK. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Nellie the Black Hen. Um, she escaped from a shipment of chickens that was being sent to the Army of Northern Virginia in 1862. And by sheer coincidence, she ran into Robert E. Lee's tent. She hid out under his cot. Uh, he took a liking to her. It was mutual. And from that point on, every day Nellie would lay an egg for him. It turned out that one of Lee's favorite breakfasts was an egg. So they, they did very well. There's even a story that after the Battle of Gettysburg, when the army is at retreat, at one point he loses sight or, or doesn't, can't figure out the whereabouts of Nellie, and he stops the supply train until he can find Nellie. They had a good, tight relationship until in 1864, during the Battle of the Wilderness, um, he, uh, Lee decides to have a dinner for his generals. Apparently, there was a horrible miscommunication. And guess who's coming to dinner, so to speak? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I guess the only good thing that could be said about this, it was an accident. It wasn't a result of foul play. So anyway, sorry about that. All right. So one of the most famous mascots and, and one of the most endearing is Sally the dog. Sally the dog was the mascot of the 11th Pennsylvania Infantry. She signed up with the unit early in uh, April of 1861. She fought in nearly every major battle of the Civil War in the Eastern Theater with, with the group. And one of her most famous uh, episodes was during the uh, Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, after the first day, she was missing. They could not find her. And it wasn't until the third day they finally you know, reconnected with her. She was found guarding the bodies of the wounded and the dead of the men of the regiment. Uh, and she would go on. Um, I, I should mention she had a distinction that no other man in the unit had. She a actually gave birth to a litter of puppies during the Civil War. Um, she would go on to fight with the unit. She was wounded at a later battle. And then, very tragically, just shortly before the end of the war, in February of 1865, she is killed in battle. Um, now, what's very moving is that when the unit decided to erect a monument to their participation in the Battle of Gettysburg, you see it in the middle here. And if you look at the bottom, the base is a life-size statue of her. And um, to this day, whenever I go up to Gettysburg, you will see people living dog biscuits or flowers in memory of Sally. So very noble um, animal. Um, there were some, dogs are probably the most common uh, animal used as a mascot, but there were a whole variety of others. One was Dick the Sheep of the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment. Uh, Dick uh, uh, was renowned for doing all sorts of tricks. He marched with the men, um, and again, he went into many battles, many deployments with them. Unfortunately, um, they were deployed to Washington, D.C., and they found out that no supplies were provided to them. So what they had to do, with, with great sorrow, is sell her to a butcher in order to uh, you know, get the provisions they needed. Now, one of the things that people say to me was, gee, Brad, you say that you know, the sheep did tricks. Sheep cannot do tricks. They absolutely can. This is a picture of a sheep I had as, as a, a teenager, as a popular kid, you can see. And uh, his name was Lex, and Lex could absolutely do tricks. He could give hoof, he could uh, turn over, which is pretty remarkable given the size of him. He was a ram, and he would come when called. So yeah, sheep are, are very intelligent animals. 
Okay, now another uh, very uh, famous uh, <laughs> mascot was Jeff Davis of the 9th <laughs> Regiment of the Connecticut Volunteers. Yeah, well, that's right. So uh, that unit was deployed off the coast of uh, uh, Louisiana, and they found this wild pig, and they adopted him, and they trained him. Uh, they called him Jeff Davis, uh, I would say in honor, but really in dishonor of Jefferson Davis. Um, and he could hold a pipe in his mouth, he could run, he could march on his hind legs, and he was a favorite of their commander, General John Phelps. Now, he stayed with the regiment even when they were deployed to occupy uh, New Orleans, which was captured shortly thereafter. But then, when they were ordered to a more dangerous assignment, they did a very humane thing. They decided to send him to a farm uh, in Connecticut where he could live out the rest of his days in peace. So it's a far happier outcome than our friend Dick. Now, a similar story, oh, and by the way, pigs can do tricks. These are two pot pigs that I had, and they could play the piano. They could march on their hind legs, especially if they spell, uh, smelled Chardonnay. Um, <laughs> they could retrieve things. As you can see, even my cat was entertained. Okay, so then, and we, Jacob and I we were talking about this in the interim. Wisconsin is the is a clear winner in unique mascots. They, one of the Wisconsin regiments is the 12th Wisconsin, which had a bear named Bruin as its mascot. Um, he joined the unit in um, 1861. He would go throughout a lot of deployments with them. He would either march with them or in several instances, he would take the train with them. And in one very famous instance, they, they uh, you know, uh, landed in, uh, um, went to Chicago. He got off the train with him and he, they marched down the main street of Chicago with him in the lead and he could keep the cadence. He was remarkably similar to all the other soldiers with one exception, he didn't like coffee, but he, he loved their basic rations, he, he think. Uh, he was very popular. Um, they went, he went with them to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, uh, but then a similar thing happened. They were deployed on what was gonna be a far more arduous and dangerous uh, assignment, and they decided to leave him there again so he could live out the rest of his life in peace and not be subjected to danger. Now, uh, again, Wisconsin, our friends in Wisconsin, they followed the practice that other states did, and many of the regiments would adopt the symbol of their state, the animal symbol of their state. Wisconsin uh, 26 had a badger. Why a badger for Wisconsin? Why is Wisconsin known as the badger state? It's because leading into the Civil War, Wisconsin was most famous not for its cheese, but for mining, right, particularly lead mining. And the early miners were known as being really tough, really you know, resilient, and in many cases, before they could establish a house or any kind of life, when they were, when they were starting their mining claim, many of them would live in the abandoned tunnels or burrows of other miners. Well, that's what badgers do. Badgers are tough, tenacious, they burrow better than almost any other animal. So it became a source of pride for people in Wisconsin to, to be compared to badgers. So when this unit formed, what do they want to be known as? They want to be known as badgers, and how to represent that? You get a badger as your mascot. So now some really exotic um, animals, and one is Douglas the camel. But before we talk about Douglas, a little background on Douglas. Um, so in 1855, this gentleman uh, in the naval uniform uh, is a fairly lowly uh, officer in the Union Navy. Um, he's, he's a lieutenant. He's a guy by the name of David Porter, who will later become a far more prominent member of the Navy. But he gets an extraordinary assignment from the Secretary of War. It's not even somebody in his department. It's the Secretary of War. A guy by the name of Jefferson Davis, who will also you know, establish a name for himself during the Civil War. So, 
At that point, he's the Secretary of War, and in 1855, he says to Porter, I want you to go to the Mediterranean and get camels and bring them back to the United States. Why? Because at the time, America is expanding rapidly to the west. There are a lot of forts and other settlements that the army has to supply. And this is before we have a transcontinental railroad. This is before we have a Panama Canal. And so the only way you can supply these outposts is overland. And many of these are situated on the other sides of deserts. So there are places where horses and even mules will have a tough time reaching. So Jefferson Davis comes up with a bright idea. Let's get camels. Let's see if they can do it. So that's what Porter does. He goes to the Mediterranean. He will get 35 camels. He will come deliver them to Texas. By the time he comes back, he has more camels than, when, than the ones he brought aboard ship. Why? Because some camels give birth on the crews. Porter becomes an expert on camels. Porter is known when he's given an assignment, he reads everything he can about them. And by the time he comes back with the camels, he says, these animals are great. We need to import as many as we can. So what Jefferson Davis does is says to him, OK, great. Go back to the Mediterranean and get me more camels. So he does. So by the time this is finished, in about 1857, the US Army has about 75 camels, and they begin what's called the Texas Experiment. And they do a, a number of field operations to see if camels will work as supply animals. It turns out they do. They're better than horses. They're better than mules. They're far more reliable under far more difficult conditions. Unfortunately, just as they're making this realization, the Civil War breaks out. The experiment is just falls apart. Many of these animals are either sold off, a lot of them are just set loose, and indeed there are reports of some of the offspring or descendants of these camels found running wild in the American Southwest well into the 1930s. But a few of these animals are used by you know, one side or the other. The most famous is Douglas the camel. Douglas is adopted by a Confederate unit, the 43rd Mississippi Infantry, and he's used to transport their instruments. He uh, unfortunately ends up in the Battle of Vicksburg. By that time, Porter is now a rear admiral in the Union Navy, and thanks to him, General Grant has positioned his crew, uh, troops around Vicksburg, Vicksburg is under siege. It's under the constant fire from Porter's naval uh, flotilla and from Grant's guns. The city is, you know, just, just suffering tremendously. And at one point, poor Douglas decides, I've had enough, enough of this. He breaks loose of his tether. He walks into no man's land. A camel makes a big target. Unfortunately, he's shot. Uh, he is re eventually retrieved. He is given full military honors. And as you can see, there is a monument to uh, the contribution that uh, Douglas or old Douglas made to his unit. So, um, you know, the, the legacy of the American Camel Corps lives on. Uh, and that's my experience with a camel. That is not my camel, but I, I, I rented one for my birthday. OK, and now, a familiar uh, sight. Uh, the most famous mascot of the Civil War is this guy, uh, Old Abe of the 8th Wisconsin. Uh, Old Abe is an eagle that was uh, purchased from a Native American tribe. He is brought to the 8th Wisconsin. He will fight in every major battle of the western sector of the Civil War with this unit, including the Battle of Vicksburg, but he survives it. He's shot at and wounded a few times, uh, but he becomes a hero, not only in Wisconsin, but throughout the Union. When that regiment is disbanded in 1864, he will be given the honor of living in Wisconsin's State House. He will be uh, used to raise morale in um, fundraising efforts throughout the North, throughout the remainder of the war. He, he becomes a very popular 
uh, hero to raise funds for Union veterans. Uh, in the year after the Civil War, he attends a veterans conference of over 25,000 Union veterans, and they all stand to applaud him. When in the course of their meeting ever he raises his wings like this, they break out into thunderous applause. He travels the country during the American centennial, um, and he will live in the State House as a hero until his death. He's still there. He's, uh, uh, well, uh, parts of him are still there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And there's, there's a story about that. Uh, there's also a controversy, if we have time, anyone has any questions about um, his, his gender, but I'll talk about that during the question and answer. But anyway, he will live beyond his, his mortality because in the 20th century, when the US Army decides to develop an airborne division, they use the likeness of old Abe in their insignia. And that is the 101st Airborne Division. And what are they known as? The Screaming Eagles. Because Old Abe was renowned for in battle getting up and screaming. And, and, and people interpreted that as urging the men to fight on. So that's, that's his legacy, the 101st Airborne Division. Now one last thing. I'm going to talk about an animal that wasn't used during the Civil War, but may have been and that is the elephant. So at the outbreak of the Civil War, President Lincoln receives an offer from the King of Siam. And the King of Siam says, I would like to bestow upon the United States to show my solidarity with you a bunch of elephants. And Lincoln goes, um, basically, thanks for the offer, but no thanks. But some people think he was kind of hasty in doing that. Then indeed, elephants might have you know, provided some very important uh, help to the Union Army uh, in a number of ways. One, they're remarkable supply animals. I mean, armies have been using them for centuries to, to, you know, to deliver massive amounts of supplies over the most difficult of terrains. But beyond that, they have tremendous offensive potential. Again, armies for centuries has, have used them as uh, sort of an armored cavalry force. Uh, they have very thick skins. Uh, they're massive animals. They have very big tusks. So if you're being charged by a bunch of elephants, that is a very frightening prospect. Uh, going back to the skins, it's thought that many of their skins may have been resistant to the kind of small arms fire that would have been used during the Civil War, particularly if those skins were augmented by armor, body armor, which again have been used for centuries on these animals. Um, so I have two pictures here. One on the left is a doctored photo of what a Union Army elephant uh, unit would have looked like. But if you think that's kind of ridiculous, look at the one on the right. That is an actual, what is it? Yeah, you're right, okay. Um, that is an actual undoctored photograph of what a Siamese military armored unit looked like. As you can see, not only are these elephants massive, but in many cases on top of them are men with rapid fire weapons or even small artillery pieces. So in many cases, this is like an early version of you know, armored artillery, uh, pardon me, armored um, cavalry or, or tank units. So, finally, I just want to talk about, you know, I've talked about the uses of animals during the Civil War, but it didn't end in the Civil War. It continued for decades after the Civil War. It continues to this very day. All these animals I've talked about, or the vast majority of them, are still playing a role in, in warfare today and in defending our country. Horses and mules have been used in struggles, including in Afghanistan, in, to supply the <coughs> American units, particularly um, specialized units. Uh, that was seen in the movie 12 Strong, for any of you who have seen that. Uh, dogs are still used by our military to protect our troops, to um, you detect things, I, I meant to say defend our troops, to detect things like explosives. Uh, bees have been trained by our military to also help in detecting explosives. Uh, 
um, the Navy uses sea lions and dolphins and other aquatic animals for coastal defense and for other special missions. So animals have always played a very essential role in defending this country, and that contribution is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. So we all owe them a debt of gratitude. So I want to thank you all very, very much for listening to this talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. But again, thank you very, very much for coming out. <laughs>